Hello, everyone. Greetings from the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development in Bangkok, Thailand, and a very warm welcome to our in-person and online audience for this global policy dialogue on advancing partnerships in support of the new program action for small islands developing states. This is the final session of the SITS Partnership Symposium that kicked off on Monday. My name is Subha Pichumsai, Na'yutiya or B in short, and I will be your MC today. This event is hosted by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, also known as UNDESA for short, with the cooperation of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia, or UNSCAP. We would like to thank the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development and the UN Peace and Development Trust Fund for their generous support. Our focus today is on small island developing states, or SITS for short. In particular, we will look at how multi-stakeholder partnerships can drive implementation of sustainable development in SITS. Our participants here will explore what factors contribute to creating and enabling environment for collaboration in SITS and how we ensure that all sectors and stakeholders partner effectively to drive positive impact on the ground. This conversation is happening at the key moment. In May this year, the UN will hold the fourth international conference on SIDS in Antigua and Barbuda, where delegates from small islands and other countries will gather to formulate a new 10-year program of action for SIDS. Before we dive in, here are some quick housekeeping. Multilingual captions are available in Zoom, if you're joining via Zoom. Just click on the captioning icon at the bottom of your screens if you're joining. And this event will include some panel discussions. Uh, pardon me, we'll start with opening remarks and then followed by a panel discussion. You are welcome to join and participate by sending us your questions or voting up others' questions via our interactive Slido tool. Just go to slido.com forward slash sits or simply go to slido.com and insert the hashtag sits to participate. Right, now that all housekeeping is out of the way, let's get today's program started. I'm very delighted to welcome here Miss Lin Yang, the Deputy Executive Secretary of UNSCAP to share her opening remarks. Miss Yang, please. Thank you, thank you, the moderator. Good morning, excellencies, distinguished delegates, you and the crop colleagues, civil society, and the private sector partners, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you back to the day two of the SEAS Partnership Symposium, advancing partnership in support of the new program of action for small island developing states during the 11th Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. I do hope that in the intervening days, you have been able to fully participate in the events of the APFSD. As underscored by the Executive Secretary of ASCAP, we are indeed very pleased to partner with DESA and co-organize this important gathering of seas from the region. This symposium is one of the few opportunities to discuss and share on the essential elements of the regional partnerships in charting the course towards resilient prosperity, the theme of the SEAS4 conference. In the Asia Pacific region, the SEAS agenda is a critical driver in moving forward the SDGs through alignment with the regional, sub-regional, and the national development agendas. Through national development strategies and the plans, member states have made notable progress over the past 10 years around the various priority areas in the Samoa pathway. However, seas are now facing a difficult reality with the growing impact of climate change and other social economic challenges, including the post-pandemic recovery process, 
and the ongoing conflict-induced crisis. Looking ahead, we have a, key, a, a few key milestone moments. The C4 International Conference provides an important opportunity to learn from the past and prepare better through strengthened cooperation and the partnership. The Summit of the Future that will take place in September and 2024 and the fourth Financing for Development Conference, which will take place in year 20, 2025, aims to adapt the current multilateral institutions, including reforming the international financial architecture to support back, better access to finance for the sustainable development of seas. Those are the opportunities we can't afford to miss. Distinguished participants, please allow me to share some reflections on two areas of your focus during the symposium. First, climate change is essential to support C's climate ambition and its development as a whole. As such, government's policies have a multiplier impact across sectors. Key here are policy actions to shift towards new and greener energy resources. By communicating national commitments and the priorities in climate action and the requirements for sustainable finance to invested, investors, there will be opportunities to support long-term investment possibilities in critical sectors. Policymakers also need to allocate in national budgets the support necessary for national climate action and ambition and sustainable finance policies. New climate finance partnerships will encourage additional financing to engage with the relevant donor countries, multilateral development banks, and private financial institutions. In addition, and importantly, policies and regulations need to ensure coherence, coordination, co and collaboration across various sectors that can support the financial system, manage risks, and shift capital towards climate action. Second, digital transformation needs to be widespread. Digital transformation represents a new and critical landscape to add value creation and distribution of benefits across our societies, especially for seas. Through application of artificial intelligence, digital data, and the connectivity, there are important ways to connect islands and their people with a new set of opportunities and the productivity growth. Digital technology is increasingly available around the Asia-Pacific seas. By utilizing digitalization, governments are able to advance the development of the blue-green sectors, skill, skill up women's entrepreneurship-led job opportunities, and prepare their economies to engage in fintech solutions. For example, by improving digital connectivity, including through the subsea cab cables, technologies can be used to integrate environmental sensors into submarine telecommunication cables. For seas, by installing these new technologies, governments can support climate and ocean observations, such as improved sea level monitoring and early warning system. At the core, we need to harness partnership to leverage the potential of the digital economy through science, technology, and innovation. Distinguished participants, in conclusion, I'm pleased to inform you that we have prepared ASCAP Pacific Perspectives 2023 advocating the aspiration of small island developing states, publication to share policy priorities and approaches in the Pacific Seas. 
I also would like to take this opportunity to introduce our Asia Pacific SDG Progress Report 2024, which was released last year. By looking at the reports, we noticed that SEAS is among the, those most in need. And also, I take this opportunity to ask our secretary co-organizer, Desa, to share with the colleague a few brochures, which is focusing on the national statistics capacity building. With all of this said, and at SCAP, along with the UN system, we will continue to work with you and ensure our expertise and the resources are combined together to strengthen the representation and the voices of the seas in the Asia Pacific and the global platforms. I wish you a very successful conclusion to the seas symposium. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Deputy Executive Secretary, for your remarks, and we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Sai Navoti, Chief of the SIDS Unit in the Department of Sustainable Development Goals at UNDESA. Mr. Navoti. Thank Over you. Team. Thank you kindly, Madam um, Facilitator. Good morning, Excellencies. Good morning, colleagues. The Deputy Executive Secretary, United Nations Economic Commission for Asia and the Pacific, and distinguished participants. Uh, it is in the, uh, indeed an honor for me to make this statement uh, on behalf of the organizers in this, the last of the symposium session today. This event will be the third last partnerships event organized under the SEEDS partnership framework. There are only two other left to be done before we draw the curtains for the SEEDS accelerated modality of actions, the Samoa pathway. In New York, we have the expert group meeting will be taking place in April, and that will be accompanied by the uh, ambassadorial meeting of the Steering Committee on SEALS Partnerships. After that, all will be heading towards St. John in Antigua to agree on our fourth SEALS agenda. And any meeting that will be taking place after that on partnerships will be taking place within the mandate of the fourth SEALS conference. I would like to, first of all, express very much our appreciations to the United Nations uh, Economic Commission for the Asia Pacific for their continued collaborations with uh, the United Nations headquarters and the Secretariat. We've had a number of events organized in Bangkok, including the training of trainers and a few other exchanges, which we have found to have been very helpful indeed in building the uh, partnerships uh, aspect in, in, in uh, regional, and sub-regional and also to the national level. And uh, partnership has now um, find its place in, as a tool for sustainable development and is getting appreciated more and more. And as we look to the fourth conference, member states have requested for us to relook into this aspect and see how it could be strengthened. And uh, we have been fortunate that the, our discussions on Monday and what we are expecting to hear today is going all going towards the exercise of advising member states on how <coughs> to strengthen uh, partnerships as a tool to assisting member states uh, implement their sustainable development goals. Now, just for reflection, there are a number of, of emphasis that is currently contained in the draft outcome for the SEEDS 4. Very prominent in it is the commitment by all to pursuing long-term sustainable development and resilient prosperity for our small island countries and will support as they exercise full ownership of their agenda to seek, establish, and they say partnerships as equal, upholding values of equity, mutual respect, cooperation, and promoting benefits across priority areas in the new 10 years agenda. So that is the vision of the, of the member states. And then in the thematic areas, if you look through, 
what they have been talking about in the, in the ocean-based economy, thematic areas, they are committing to establish public-private sector partnerships. And also in the renewable sector, uh, thematic areas, um, member states are urgently um, requiring to enhance just energy transition partnerships and um, strengthen their partnerships at the sub-regional, regional, and international level to control sources of marine plastic pollutions and uh, to support SEEDS identify the financing and capacity gap in meeting biodiversity objective and develop partnership, particularly with the private sector, to develop innovative strategy to bridge these gaps. So these are just, I'm just citing some of the examples that are being envisaged by member states as area where partnerships will need to be built in the next 10 years. And of course, there is a particular section on partnership on its own in, in the outcome document. And it is um, very peculiar to note that uh, they are committing to take the following action to mobilize partnerships in, in seeds, expand and diversify partnerships with local authorities, civil societies, and non-governmental organizations, foundations, private sector, and international financial institutions. So uh, partnerships is going to thrive and continue to grow in the next 10 years. And uh, it is the efforts of colleagues like those who are present here today will continue to be the bearer of the tools that are going to assist our small island developing states with the development agenda and the implementation of it. And we have been quite fortunate for the past 10 years together with our colleagues from the outreach and partnership branch of the Division of Sustainable Development together with the unit, SEEDS unit to be working with some of you and working with uh, our islands and our governments who have been very readily supportive of our, our efforts to continue this work and we are really looking forward on how we could improve on this in the next 10 years. So with those, I would like to once again thank SCAP. They have made available to us the executive secretary to open our symposium and they've been kind also to have the deputy executive secretary come and address our final day. So with those few words, thank you kindly. Thank you very much, Mr. Navoti, for your perspective. We really appreciate it. And now I would like to hand the floor to Juliet Hawker from the government of Vanuatu, who will fill us in on partnerships for climate finance. Over to you, Juliet. Good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is my honor to present the key insights that have been gleaned from discussions during the session on partnerships for climate financing. So throughout the discussions, um, one of the vital distinctions between climate financing and development financing became quite apparent. And there was also a bit of discussion around initiatives such as the Green Climate Fund, um, as well as loss and damage funds. And these mechanisms are pivotal in addressing adverse impacts of climate change, particularly for SIDS. The dialogue also emphasized the necessity of partnerships um, to assist SIDS in how to assess climate financing, how to craft projects that meet requirements and effectively implement climate change programs. And one of the things that was also um, underscored was that tailoring financial strategies that are rooted in scientific evidence and community realities are really essential for SIDS in long-term transformative um, investments within climate adaptation. Also, the session highlighted the multifaceted role that partnerships can bring. Um, so we're looking at beyond financial assistance, uh, principles such as accountability, capacity building, innovation, and community engagement were identified as being crucial components of effective collaboration for SIDS. And through fostering more inclusive, transparent, and sustainable partnerships, stakeholders can ensure that initiatives not only secure funding, but they're able to deliver more tangible outcomes and benefits to the vulnerable communities in, in our islands. 
In exploring areas for partnership enhancement, um, there were discussions identified that um, identified key key areas or avenues to consider. These also include streamlining coordination um, efforts, enhancing enabling conditions for project implementation, strengthening our monitoring and evaluation mechanisms in countries, fostering innovative financing models, promoting community-led initiatives, addressing challenges with technical expertise, and advocating for donor support for forward-thinking um, solutions. So in summary, the discussions underscored the indispensable role of partnerships in addressing climate financing challenges and ad advancing climate resilience in SIDS. And this is through embracing collaborative, transparent, and sustainable um, approaches. Stakeholders can maximize the impacts of collective efforts and work towards a more resilient and sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet, for giving us a flavor on what key points emerged from the first day of the symposium. So let's hear some more from Talisha Kobiti from the Pacific Disability Forum, who will fill us in on partnerships for science, technology, innovation, and digitalization. Over to you, Talisha. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to present the key messages that emerged during the session on partnerships for science, technology, innovation, and digitalization. So the session uh, highlighted that partnerships are crucial for advancing the sustainable development in SIDS. The presentation by experts emphasized the significance of collaboration, particularly with the private sector, in addressing challenges related to digital inclusion, innovation, and driving sustainable development in SIDS. Some of the key points included the stark reality of the digital divide in the Asia Pacific region, with over 2 billion people being, uh, sorry, lacking access to digital resources. Also, successful initiatives in various SIDS aimed at social protection, climate resilience, and utilizing technology for informed decision making. The di thirdly, the transformative potential of digitalization exemplified by initiatives like smart villages and projects in remote areas like South Malakula Island. And finally, UNEP's initiatives addressing environmental challenges in SIDS through the, the development of an environmental data portal and citizen science programs like the Green Fund Initiative. Some insights from the group discussions highlighted are the crucial role of leadership in driving partnerships and f facilitating development initiatives, also, the wealth of resources that academia and research institutions bring to partnerships. We also looked at challenges such as the complexity of funding processes and the need for better integration between research and policy spheres. The invaluable role of communities and grassroots organizations and partnerships alongside challenges like limited resources and funding constraints also, the importance of recognizing and supporting contributions of small and medium enterprises in partnership discussions. Recommendations included fostering closer collaboration, streamlining funding mechanisms, and empowering local communities for meaningful participation. In conclusion, the session underscored the importance of collaboration, inclusivity, and innovation in driving partnerships for sustainable development in SIDS. These recommendations provide a roadmap for stakeholders to work together effectively and create positive change in SIDS communities. Thank you. Many thanks for your perspective, Talisha, and it sounds like a valu valuable discussion was held on Monday. Moving to our final speaker in this opening segment, let's hear from Ola Gorenson, Sustainable Development Officer in the Division for SDGs, UNDESA, who will give us an update from the discussions on higher education and SIDS. Ola, the floor is yours now. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Moderator, for uh, giving me the floor. So ladies and gentlemen, so allow me to present some of the key points that emerged uh, during the lunchtime brown bag event, which focused on enhancing knowledge in higher education to support sustainable development in small island developing states and building uh, a broad coalition to support these efforts. The crucial role of higher education in driving sustainable development in SIDS was outlined. The key points include one, 
integration of investment in higher education. There was a call to incorporate increased investment um, opportunities in higher education institutions in SIDS. Two, teaching sustainable development. Higher education institutions should focus on enhancing the teaching in, on sustainable development across various disciplines. Three, support the research and analysis. It's important to support innovative research and analysis, analysis within these institutions to address sustainability challenges specific to SIDS. Four, adopting sustainable campus practices. Higher education institutions should lead by, by example by adopting sustainable practices within their own campuses. And five, on bolstering partnerships. Collaboration among higher education institutions in SIDS is crucial. This includes enhancing partnerships in areas such as mobility, funding, teaching, capacity building, and research to amplify efforts towards sustainable development. In conclusion, it's imperative to capitalize on existing efforts and ecosystems within the UN and beyond to cultivate a robust coalition in favor of higher education in support of sustainable development in SIDS. Enhancing the SIDS University Consortium is essential to effectively tackle these challenges. And participants finally reiterated these aspirations and stressed the importance of, an, of ongoing dialogue in the months ahead to develop a comprehensive roadmap for the consortium in anticipation of the fourth conference on SIDS this coming May. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing these point interventions, Ola. Now let's move to the panel discussion phase for this morning's program. And just a reminder to our virtual audience that you can send questions or vote up other people's questions um, by using the Slido tool. Simply use the hashtag SIDS or type into your browser slido.com forward slash SIDS. And a big thank you to um, all the speakers this morning as well. Now I'll hand the hosting duties over to Darian Stibb from the Partnership Initiative, who will introduce the panelists and also moderate the panel discussion. Dr. Stibb, if you're ready, then I'll hand over the stage to you now. Thank you. Can I ask our panelists to please come and, and join us on the stage? Wonderful. Good morning. I'm Darian Stibby. I am the director of the Partnering Initiative, and we are an international NGO set up to drive effective collaboration across all societal sectors towards delivering sustainable development. And we work very closely with, with our colleagues, UN DESA, on something called the Partnership Accelerator, which is set up to really build capabilities at the country level within the UN system and within country governments to be able to support and drive collaboration for the SDGs. And the reason why these programs exist is because we are at a crossroads. We have huge challenges, but we have huge opportunities in SIDS today. We know that we need to decarbonize our economies. We have huge issues and challenges with climate adaptation, but we also have new technologies coming to bear and that can be applied. We have the potential to build a blue economy, but then we have ch serious challenges when it comes to, to skills in business. We have issues around health with growing challenges of, of obesity and mental health issues. We have challenges around plastic pollution that we heard of earlier. And what connects all of these challenges is that they are all system issues. They are system interconnected challenges. And they have environmental, societal, and economic issues as part of them. 
Now, if you're going to tackle societal challenges of these sort, you need to bring to bear all of the resources from all of society. We have to have a level of, of funding. We need the development financial cooperation. We need the, the private sector, we need who, in order to be able to, to decarbonize their, their supply chains and operations, to be able to bring technologies to bear, to be able to use commercially viable approaches to really be able to deliver lasting change. And of course, also we need private investment in many of these areas to deliver transformation. But we need, we need academia to be able to, to build skills, provide evidence and, and data. We need NGOs and the UN system providing technical assistance. And most importantly, we need civil society. We need the voices of the people, both to co-design solutions to make sure that they are fully fitting to the context, but also to ensure that the solutions that we do develop are fair and just. The thing is, we all want the same thing. We all want a healthy environment, prosperous economies, thriving societies. In the end, there is an alignment of interest across all of societal sectors. And it is that alignment of interest that we need to build on to be able to bring the unique resources of all society sectors together to deliver transformational partnerships that can ensure that we can achieve the transformations in society, in the way that we live and work and use resources that are essential moving forward. That's what we want to see, but the challenge is it's not easy. We are not seeing anything like the number of partnerships and the collaboration that's required if we are going to deliver on the Samoan pathway or the sustainable development goals or what comes next for the next version of the pathway. So today, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at what are some of the challenges to collaboration? What are some of the barriers? And importantly, what can a new SIDS partnership framework for action do to overcome these barriers, to be able to support collaboration, help make partnerships happen at a scale and a quality that will genuinely shift the dial. And today we have a, a wonderful panel from government, from civil society, from international organizations to discuss exactly this issue. But we also have not just the panel, we have a room full of experts. In fact, we have an internet full of experts. And so I very much welcome at any point during the sessions, please feel free to, to raise your hand, or if you're online, please feel free to, to put questions or comments into Slido so that we can integrate those as we go. So I'm going to ask our, our colleagues actually to sort of introduce them, themselves, but with, with an initial question, which is really about what they see as, what is this vision that, that you see as a panel and what I'd really like is if you've got any also examples of these forms of partnerships of any kind that you can sort of give to help, help illustrate to the room, provide some color to it. I'm going to ask, it's going to move from, from left to right. Um, Lainey, welcome. I wonder if you, I can ask you to introduce your, yourself and the, the Blau Association of NGOs. Good morning. Uh, I hope this is the last speaking session. I'm uh, Lani Romangasau. I represent the uh, Bella Association of NGOs. Uh, it's a coordinating mechanism for the civil society organizations in Palau that also includes local community organizations. Uh, what I envision in the future is we always say back home, people center, the people must be included in all the efforts, let's not uh, take people afterthought, let's not take them for granted, they must be uh, centered. Mm -hmm. Just to give a very brief um, uh, example of the best practice that we have back home is the public-private partnership where we have, I said this in the other event, but I'm gonna stress it more, 
of um, accessibility uh, effort that we had back home. Of course, we come from a Pacific with limited resources, so we have to pull the government sectors, the, uh, the private sectors, the community-based organizations. We have to pull together to have an understanding of that accessibility goes beyond the facilities. It goes into, we're in the era of uh, digitalization, so we have this partnership together that we hope that we continue to raise awareness, build the capacity of the people who are involved, and that will continue to collaborate uh, in the future. So that's something that I see as one of the best practice in Palau. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll talk about in a moment about where you are with, with, with that and some of the challenges perhaps to making that, that happen. Thank you so much. Kate, over to you. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I've been working on partnerships, I think, since the World Summit on Sustainable Development, which is terribly ageing. But anyway, um, I think what I can see now is there's a lot more partnerships that do exist. I agree with you, there's not enough. There's still a problem <laughs> around coordination. I think, um, you know, we get these great ideas and then everyone wants to make their own initiative and then it becomes difficult to work with others and then everyone's trying to chase the same people, money, everything, it's um, a significant problem, I think. And I can see that happening as we move into SIDS 4. I think also um, there's an interesting paradox in the SIDS space that the relationship with each other is, there's a lot of similarities in lived experience, maybe not Singapore so much, but, but also in the socioeconomic environmental space. Um, but they're really remote from each other, so we have to look at what are the solutions for enabling um, collaboration of any type that's effective. It can't all be online. Online is good, but online and tech is not going to be the whole solution, so we need to look at what is the balance between bringing people together, particularly at a technical level. There's a lot of opportunity, I think, for high-level people to come together. Um, whoever made 7,000 Oceans meetings needs to be shot. Um, <laughs> just going to say. Uh, but, you know, I, I think what I see is there's some amazing initiatives being done at a very local level, and I think Lainey really touched on that. How do we lift those up um, into the international space so they get the attention and support that they deserve, but also so they can act as a guidepost or an example for others? Um, yeah, that, and I can think of lots of great examples of um, those types of partnerships. We really need to see how does any of the things that we're doing actually make an impact to people um, in their islands, and that, I think, is always our greatest challenge. So now we've decided data and monitoring and evaluation is the way we're going to do that, is it? I don't know. We need to work together. Before we go too far into the challenges and solutions, can you just give one, one example um, of a partnership where you see... I think one that we're working on at the moment, which is um, Local 2030 Islands Network, where we're actually bringing people together annually or in communities of practice um, from around the SIDS, around the world, I think has a great opportunity for trying to solve some of that, how you um, advance things in a rapid way, um, because that's really what we need to do. The challenges are moving fast. We need to move fast. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, Gilson Pina from Capo Verde. Welcome. Please tell us, in terms of partnerships for your, for your government, what's, what's the vision and if you do have a, an example, yes. all the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Gilson Pina, as you mentioned, uh, I'm National Director for, for Planning at the Minister of Finance in, in Cape Verde. Uh, so thank you also for this invitation. Uh, sharing this uh, vision that we have for SEEDS, I think we have to talk about for what we move on. So what is more important for us and what we need to look for. Uh, when we talk about seeds, we talk about vulnerability. And I think all the vision that we have to have and the focus that we have to have is to see how partnership can support this question about vulnerability. So how we can use uh, partnership to at least create uh, resilience and reduce the vulnerability. Why am why I'm saying that? Because, of course, all this question, if we move to a partnership for digital, digitalization, climate change redu reduction, and all this question to move everyone, uh, I think at the, uh, at the end, we have to see 
for, as I mentioned, vulnerability. So th this is my concern because as a government, uh, let me say, I'm National Director for Planning, we are in charge of implementation of policies. You can see, uh, for example, I can give you a clear example. In Cape Verde, there's a couple of SDGs that's already met in Cape Verde. Uh, but during the COVID, we lost them. So that means if you try to implement, because partnership is for that, to make country stronger and also to make country achieve uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, but if you achieve it, you're not sustainable. Maybe even for 2030, you can do it. But 2031, you can lose it. So you can lose it. So the question is, uh, we have to look on that. So this is the vision that I have, how we can support the country. Uh, put things on place and to promote, um, uh, um, let me say, resilience and reduce uh, vulnerability. And the only way to do that is partnership, to put everyone in place, and we can be strong and uh, help each other. Of course, there's a couple of um, uh, partnership examples in, in Cape Verde, uh, specific on the, on the Cape Verde economy, and we also we, we are engaged, uh, some of them relate to inter, um, regional uh, um, uh, pathway. Um, but most important one, we have a couple of them to support the accounts, and also the other one, uh, bring uh, together uh, government, municipalities, and also the social, activity, so, so, um, social civil, uh, civil society to, um, to support, especially for the marine uh, protection in, in Cape Verde. So th there's a lot of way in, in Cape Verde where we have been done uh, a couple of things. I think we are in a good way, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, I think and it's a great example you gave. Marine protected areas is something which is very sort of, it, it's clearly you need, you need the government for the regulation and the policy. You need the, the, the private sector, the, the, the fisher people, the companies, et cetera. But most importantly, you need, you need the people. I mean, marine protected areas, you have to have the, the support of the people to be able to implement them. So thank you very much indeed for that. Misha Kauf, you're from the, the OECD. Just your, your, your thoughts on, on that. What is that vision for partnerships? Thank you very much, seat. Mr. Moderator, and it's lovely to be here, so thank you for the invitation. Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, my name is Misha Kaur. I'm one of the senior leads in the OECD around public governance. So a lot of the work I do is around supporting uh, governments with the right institutional cap capacities, the right enabling conditions, environments to achieve their goals, such as their SDGs, um, as well as things like establishing the right partnerships in order to do this. Um, I'm also leading a study, which is why I'm also here as part of this event, around how do we improve capacity strengthening support that's provided to small island states <laughs> as well, um, support that's provided from development partners and uh, partnerships comes up a lot in that. Um, but maybe just to mention, I don't, haven't just worked in international organizations. I spent 17 years in the Australian government and led a whole range of health justice partnerships um, and led the COVID economic recovery measures, which relied a lot on partnerships. So I know the on the ground challenges, perhaps uh, less for, from an island's perspective, but from a government perspective to this. Just a little bit on, on vision. Um, you know, I think uh, everyone here has already spoken about it, that we can't walk alone. The types of issues that we are trying to solve around sustainable development requires uh, the collective knowledge, the collective learning, the collective action, the collective resources uh, of many, many partners. Uh, and so it is really, really important. For me, the vision is around two things. Um, we often talk about sustainable development goals as you know, what we are trying to achieve. I think for me, one of the benefits, one of the areas that we have potential in partnerships is thinking about the how. That partnerships is one of the ways we can have a sustainable approach to actually achieving the sustainable uh, development goals. The second part for me is a real cliche, but I'll say it anyway, um, and it's about how do we have partnerships that really allow us to be greater than the sum of our parts, and I think the in-depth discussion today that we have around the challenges, the mechanisms, what that means in practice will really start to, to, to enlighten that that's not actually an easy task. It's not just about putting a lot of people together. Um, maybe for a quick example, I won't, uh, there's many uh, fantastic examples um, happening. I'll give us a slightly more lighthearted one. Um, and that's actually for, for why I'm here, uh, obviously part of this, but also hosting an event on, on Monday and Tuesday. And that's been a partnership uh, with m several multilaterals or international organizations, the UN, myself at the OECD, uh, a 
several countries, Thailand, uh, the UK. We couldn't have done it without each other. We wouldn't have had a venue. We wouldn't have had uh, the logistical arrangements without uh, the UN. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to have uh, the study tour of the visas without uh, Thailand. We wouldn't have had the, the financing without the support of the UK government, uh, obviously the OECD and my, myself and the work that we've done. Um, it was a real learning that even across ourselves, it, uh, it was extremely difficult. We were fighting over mismatched processes, unaligned things, very simple things like one organization wanting to use an electronic process, the other only wanting to use paper processes. So it was a really great learning in the sense of um, partnerships can be really difficult even for something that may seem as simple as bringing people together for a conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much indeed. Yes, things that seem so simple. The reality is when you get organizations together, the institutional cultures and the way of operating can really get, get in the way. William Ngalo, you are from the government of the Solomon Islands. Tell us about yourself and tell us about the vision for partnerships. Thank you, uh, moderator and excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is William Ngalo. As the moderator has mentioned, I work uh, with the Ministry of National Planning and Development Coordination within the Development Cooperation uh, Unit. Um, my, vision, my vision for this meeting is um, people taking ownership of development initiatives. I believe that when we play our parts in the development initiatives, we can make a sustainable development. Uh, to give you um, an example of of a partnership that we have. Uh, within the division um, I work with, we have this uh, Solomon Islands Aid Management and Development Cooperation Policy and a partnership framework for effective development uh, cooperation. So we play a role where we bring donor partners together um, to, uh, to partner and uh, coordinate and collaborate with the line ministries as well as private sectors. So we did a lot of initiatives that um, they can come together and dialogue. And one of which is the joint dialogue. We usually have it two, two times a year. Um, Solomon Islands Government and Development Partners joint dialogue. We also have monthly donor meetings, which is co-shared by UNDP and our ministry. <laughs> and also we have uh, bilateral and multilateral meetings we organize every year. So those are some of the examples we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what's great is we're ready to be getting into some of the, the examples of, of how to make these partnerships happen. You know, this, the dialogue is absolutely an initial phase to, these, to, to collaboration. So I think we can get an impression. We get a feel this is what we, we want to achieve. We know the importance of these, these partnerships. We've got some good examples, but we're already hearing actually even what seems like a relatively simple arrangement can be difficult to put together in practice. So the next, this next section really is about the challenges and unpicking what it is that's preventing these partnerships from happening. Why, what are those barriers? Why are we not, ha not seeing more and more effective partnership? And this is where this will be a discussion with people in, in the room and online as well as our panel. But basically, in, from, from the panel's perspective, if anybody wants to just give us some thoughts on what do you see as the, the challenges that, pre that prevent much more multi-stakeholder collaboration. You're all so polite. Please just, just, just go ahead, put your light on, and start speaking. Thank you. I was awaiting for indication. <laughs> no, first of all, um, I think what can move us uh, to make things happen um, is to see, first of all, um, as I mentioned before in my, in my intervention, we see the fox. We see for what we need to work on. And what we need to see is who can do that. So to say who can do that and also to see how we can do that. So first of all, we need a strong leadership and to see the political will. This is the folks that we need for, for, to, make, to make things happen. So that means the effective leadership uh, can make us, uh, and also political will can make us um, to see how we can 
bring stakeholders. Uh, we can bring all of us on the same on the same page to work for to work for for what what we need. Uh, but I think more than this is to see the clear policy framework. So Sorry, the clear policy framework. So to have a, uh, a clear idea on what we want and to see the institutional arrangements. So since you have this clear policy frameworks and also the institutional uh, arrangement, this can work together on strong leadership and what you are, for, what you are working for and also how we can, we, we can make things. And of course, as I mentioned, you need to know who must do what we need. To know who we need, to, to, to know who should work on what you need, you must also to engage them. So that's mean, you mentioned in your intervention, uh, we need stakeholders. We need this government, we need the social civility, we need the international partners, so all of them. Since we have them on the same page, we can see that it can work. Because you know who should do anything that you want to, to do. I think this is the way that we, 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 we can do it. And of course, it can work in terms of the transparency and the inclusive decision make. This can also support us, of course, create capacity building. We talked it on, on, um, on Monday to see how we can do and how this can, 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 can support. And of course, it's very important, uh, I, will, I will close on this, on this intervention, to see the recognize of interconnected challenge that, and opportunities. So you have challenge, you have opportunities, you, you have to see how we can move then at the same place and how we can create opportunities to see how we can solve the challenge that we, that we have. So thank you very much. Thank you. In fact, can I, I'm just going to have a follow-up question, if I may, and um, not necessarily talking about, about your country, your government. One of the things that, that we have seen I'd like to get your comments on is a couple of things. One is a, a lack of integration across ministries, because you talked about these are multi-issue problems that cut across ministries, and that can be a significant, significant challenge. We, you also talked about uh, about leadership, and what we have also seen in some cases is where governments take a very strong lead, but in a very much a, well, this is what we want to happen, and everybody else needs to come around and do what we say. Now, you, you actually talked about inclusive decision-making in, in, in Capo Verde, but we do, I wonder if, if anyone has sort of seen issues of these kinds um, in, in the various governments, or maybe it, interministerial challenges are pretty much everywhere. Is this still is that a challenge for, for you? No, I, in Cape Verde, as I mentioned, you have to bring everyone on the same place. Um, all the documentation that we prepare in Cape Verde, it's not done by government. Mm. Uh, we, we have what we call it Cape Verde Ambition uh, 2030. Uh, is the vision that to support us to implement the SDGs and also have our national strategic plan. Mm. It's a five year strategic plan. We, we have one from 2017 and 21 and now 2022 uh, until 26. Uh, all these documents were prepared by government, social safety, private sectors. So that means if you want to do something, there's a, um, a phrase, uh, a sentence, I forgot who was mentioned it to see. If you want to do something for me, do it with me. Mm. So that means uh, if you want to do something, you have to put everyone on place uh, to see what you want. You want this? Okay, let's do it together. And, but explain me what you want. So since you explain me, since you, you see, I want this, um, this object, object on this place. We can work together. So that means, um, of course, you can have leadership. It's not say, okay, Tell me what you want, I will do it. No, tell me what you want, I will do you, I, I will uh, tell you how we can do that. And together, thinking together, uh, support each other, because we are not, I used to say, we are not invented well. Because we are together, we know a uh, different way to do some things, but the question is, if we bring all of us on the same place, on the same place, and bring someone can support us also, we can, work together and we can put things on place and of course all of us will be uh, more uh, satisfied at the end of the if we conclude the the implementation of the process so thank you
Brilliant. So, yes, bringing everyone together for a collective development of, of the priorities and the plan. And then what, you're sound, what sounds a little bit like you're talking about collaborative leadership. It's not leadership, me telling everyone what to do. It's about that more collaborative approach. Misha. Um, perhaps I'll just respond a little bit to, to the conversation that's happening and throw in a couple of new thoughts. Um, one of the things I think you mentioned is interministerial coordination. Um, big guts of what I do is working with governments ar around this, actually. Um, and I think we, we think about partnerships, yeah, outside and externally, but actually uh, institutional capacities around coordinating across minis ministries uh, is, is a huge challenge for partnerships. Um, even being able to, to bring to, get to, uh, to align, I guess, interest strategies, agendas, even within a government is really, really challenging, let alone a government uh, partnering outside government. So I think this is definitely a challenge. Maybe I'll just throw a, a different perspective on um, perhaps what we're calling, you know, collaborative leadership, collaborative decision making. And uh, in a whole range of partnerships that I've been working on, I've been starting to think a little bit uh, about this. and rather than trying to devolve all decision making and giving everyone equal decision making, perhaps we need to recognize uh, more, more explicitly the different powers and roles that different actors play in a partnership and actually lean into that. Because there is no world where everyone will have equal decision making powers. There is no world where everyone will equally come with the same resources, etc. So I think there is, a, there is a need to be a bit pragmatic and a bit realistic if we're going to make partnerships work rather than too idealistic. So that's just my little, you know, and, and probably related to that is this notion of bringing everyone together, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but perhaps that's different from gaining consensus and whether consensus is something we should really be striving for in, in partnerships and whether that's really possible. Anyway, so that was just to respond, but I'll throw just a couple of other things out. I think, um, you know, I already mentioned it. It's the, the sort of recognition of, of, of power dynamics, and sometimes we try and, you know, squish that and hide that on the table and not really recognize and discuss it. Um, but I think that's important, and the different interests um, that, that people have, putting that out on the table, I think, is really important for, for partnerships. Um, we've talked a lot about different institutional um, capacities that are challenging, everything from, you know, the, the policies, the laws, the governing frameworks, uh, everything down then to, uh, you know, time zones, di digital infrastructure, um, c the actual funding, the resources that are related that can be really difficult for it. Um, the other two things maybe just to throw in here is I think sometimes we think about partnerships or engaging with people as the more the better. We have everyone in the room and that's the way to go. And I think actually, perhaps maybe I throw, throw this in, everyone can, uh, can feel free to critique this, um, that we need to be a little bit smarter about who should be in the room in this partnership, why, and, and think about that. Because bringing more people in is actually quite difficult. And the last thing I'd say is that there is often an absence, we forget that it takes effort and it takes time to create partnerships. We often have a great idea, a great intention, because as you said, Mr. Moderator, we do have these shared goals, um, and so we rush into partnerships, and we don't think about the time it's required to set up the governing structures, to set up the institutional side, to really think about interests, the ways of working. The fact that partnerships rely on humans, and we forget the human element a lot of the time, and building those trust and relationships are really important. Um, so, oh yeah, I'll pause there for now, but uh, I just wanted to thank Jilson, because usually it's very easy to talk about challenges, and you spoke positive about solutions first, so that's nice, and I just brought it back down a little bit, so <laughs> I'll pause. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, and yes, there's so many issues brought up there. Uh, Katie or, or Lainey, do you want to come in, particularly on this, this issue of power, I think, and <coughs> inclusion, and who needs to be at the table, and that issue about consensus. Should partnerships always be about finding consensus? I mean, I, I do agree with OECD. Yes, we want to bring everyone in the table. We want to be, uh, we want to achieve that star, but it's never possible. There's no such perfect policy, perfect plan. So I think we need to be smart of who we're involving. Sometimes we in the Pacific or country of Palau with limited resources. I mean, here I am and my colleague from there, from the government, and I know we're already thinking about going back home and people are thinking, oh, you're the two most expert, up-to-date knowledge in SDGs, but just, you know, we, very few people, we wear so many hats and we try to bring and align 
uh, our efforts and try to centralize them. But it really takes a political will. We, we need to be smart and we need to prioritize on how to be, uh, on how to achieve on such efforts. Because there's so many efforts, we're working in silo, but we need to be, you know, we need to think creatively of how we can achieve such things. Sometimes for us, we say, oh, let's mandate them, whether it's a legislation, like for us, we, uh, we have this policy that we're trying to do, and with all the policies that have been existed, they're just lying in the closet without implementation. So we're trying to mandate it by the legislation, resourcing it, financially resourcing it with domestic resources. But here I am thinking, okay, we have that financial resources, but what if the government changes, and then the government changes the <coughs> legislation? How will that be effective? So we really need to be smart and who we will who are our partners, and how do we work well together. And just, just to mention on this one, we've had somebody on online, thank you, Nund Keswazing, who wrote, CSOs are important partners in, SID, in SDGs in SIDS. We mobilize local actors, but the challenge is CSOs need strong support and finance to be able to play this role. And that's certainly an issue that we see everywhere, is that we have to have the people, we need the people at the table to be able to design the best solutions, but you need the time and resources to be able to make that happen. Yeah, I think it really comes down to what is the problem that you're trying to solve, because we're talking about all sorts of different partnerships here. We're talking about yeah. island level ones, we're talking about regional ones, international ones. I think um, if anyone was at Samoa, there was a lot of focus on more of a donor relationship in the partnership space. So that's a different type of um, partnership. I think the key thing is really understanding what's the problem you're trying to solve, and then you get the group of people that need to be engaged in that. Um, I think there's some really good um, effort, partnerships that are really focused on coordination, like in the Pacific, <coughs> the Pacific Resilience Partnership, for example, and those types of ones, which are trying to, they're mobilizing kind of partnerships at local level or engaging partnerships at local level into regional action and you also see that at the international level. Um, I think the just having been involved in a lot of partnerships and I advise a lot of partnerships um, that are really multi-country ones, the key is not to overthink what the partnership is trying to do. You need core strategy. You don't need to all agree on everything that you do together. Mm -hmm. Um, the things you do together, yes, but what your organisation or country or thing is doing, that's a separate thing, and that is often a, a tricky space in a partnership space that um, people find really difficult. And I think the other important thing, um, we need partnerships to really demonstrate what their impact is, um, some type of, to me that's probably the biggest thing, how do we show impact? Um, and I think that's a real struggle, because there isn't a lot of, um, ways that you can actually do that, and that to me is an area, you know, how do we show impact to um, Bango, for example, of <coughs> things that regional and international partnerships are doing, or to the government, um, and I think that's uh, a space that could be really strengthened. And in fact, that's a, a question that, that Silla Opa online, thank you, Silla said something similar, what can we do to ensure the, the evidence and, of impact of partnerships at country level, civil society, and ensure accountability as well? So it's, it's clearly an issue others share. So we've, we've heard a bit from the, from the panel. Please do put up your hand if you want to add something in this conversation at any stage, any sort of points you would like to, to bring in. I'm just going to, as you're thinking about that, we undertook, so we, the, the Partnerships uh, Accelerator with our colleagues at Partnerships 2030, undertook a, an international research study looking at what it takes to make partnerships happen. And one element of that which came up and which is sort of beginning to come up here is a, a bit is around actually people need the skills, the professional capabilities for partnering. And in this, in this study, 93% of people said their partnership would have been better if, anyone had the, if everyone had been trained and had the same language and were using the same approaches to, to collaboration, had these professional skills. But only 13% of people said that there was actually any training available in their country on collaboration and partnership. 
I'm just wondering from, from your side whether this, you see this as, as an issue, that we're not, it's not in our public policy courses or our, our, our Masters of Business Administration. And if not, why not? Please. Commercializing the global um, global um, initiatives is uh, very important um, to ensure that um, they are included in the frameworks of the nation. Um, because um, when you look at uh, se several countries or certain countries, um, usually when we look at them, they already have their own um, roles and responsibilities um, within the ministries. And in order to do, to do other roles, um, it will be quite a little bit difficult. Um, in some cases, as we have mentioned, um, lack of capacity and as well as uh, lack of human resources. Um, so I guess um, if we can uh, nationalize the, these initiatives, um, uh, the government can uh, employ them into their work plans and they can carry them out along with the existing works. And in terms of their capacity, that has to be um, developed as well. Thank you. Thank you, and that does, that does speak to priorities here, because of course there are not sufficient resources to do everything. And the question is the degree to which governments and others are prioritizing partnerships with, with the private sector, of, for example, to be able to deliver development in, inside the country. And from our experiences in general, when we did, when we did a bit of a survey, in fact, of attitudes to, even attitudes to the SDGs, there was very little understanding of the, the potential for partnerships to deliver on the SDGs. But also, and it'd be interesting to get comments both on, on the professional capabilities, but this, this second issue, that there was not a, in general, an understanding across societal sectors that they had an important role to play in development. So if you talk to your, to your average company or your, your average citizen, they're not necessarily seeing the SDGs or the development of their country as their problem. And then we also found a significant lack of trust between government and civil society and between government and business. Of course, it's different in different countries, but overall, it was very significant lack of trust, which also does not help for partnerships. I wonder if anyone would like to sort of comment about that, that issue, that we don't feel like we're all in it together and wanting to come together, and actually, we don't really trust the other sectors. Uh, let me put things on, on a specific way. Um, I think the, the question, as you mentioned, is to see uh, we have a policy, we have a strategy, we have goals to map. Um, but the question is who should work with us? Sometimes, you have potential, but you don't have resource to do that. Sometimes you have resource, but you don't know how you can do that. Mm. Uh, there are the two ways for this. I, I can give you an example in Cape Verde. We want to be uh, the number one in Africa in terms of doing business. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have been implemented a couple of um, uh, reforms in terms of the uh, support public administration to be more free to, to people, to, to, to the private sectors. But of course, there's something that we cannot do. We have resources, we have measures, we have policies, but the public administration is quite, let me say, complicated to do that. But you have private sectors. There are some private sectors, uh, organizations, um, they can do that because they know how they can do that, but they don't have resources. So what we did in Cape Verde is to bring them to this objective, we said this is the objective that we have, we want you to do that. So, uh, but uh, we know that we don't have resource, you don't have resource. We can bring resource to you, we can give resource to you, and you can do that for us. 
Because it's not, actually, at the end, it's not for us because who, if you want to develop private sectors, is for private sectors, not for government. So, of, of course, government can collect tax at the end, but the question is to promote private sectors. So, this uh, brings us to this conclusion. You have to know who is the stakeholders to implement partnership, to implement uh, the, the SDGs. But sometimes, if you know who is the best one, you can know if they have capacity, if they have resource, and even if they don't have, you have to see how you can promote this. Um, we are talking about this for national level. Sometimes it's very important to see also for regional level. Let's talk about seeds. You know, there's a lot of seeds. Of course, we are not at the same level. There's a seeds in under level, another one more specific, uh, with more capacity. But sometimes you have international institutions, international cooperation, and also other uh, uh, countries that's more developed. If you can have this triangular relationship, we can support each other. So we know that you, we, we implement a lot of reforms in your country, but we need to do that. We don't have resource. We can bring some partnership uh, uh, outside of this relationship that can support us. So I, I think this is the way that we have to work and to bring all these uh, conditions to give the opportunity to people, to give opportunity to stakeholders to be, uh, uh, le, to, to be on place to implement the reforms. Thank you. And can I just add one question before you come in, Kate, which is, do you feel that your government, or rather, more importantly, does the private sector feel like the government's on their side? And does the government feel like the private sector is on their side, that it is collective wanting to drive forward the economy of the country? Fortunately, in Cape yes. As I mentioned, we, we work together, and we made uh, last month uh, this agreement between private sector, union, and, and government. This is the first time I saw in Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. uh, the conversation is easily, because all of them, they are on the same page. Of course, they, they, they discuss. We are not, if, to, to have different perspective, it doesn't mean that we are not on the same page. So we can discuss, we can sit together, but the most important one is at the end, we see, we look for the same direction. And this is the question that I, I can see in Cape Verde. Uh, the private sector is, uh, let me say, very engaged with the government, and of course, government give to private sectors the role to, to implement their policy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Kate? May I, may I have an intervention? Um, Kate, is your, if it's on this particular point, then I'll just allow Kate, if you may, and then, then we'll come back in. Um, yeah, mine is actually just going back to the people side of things, the training. I think what I see a lot in the people that are good at doing partnerships is they're the people sinking under everyone wanting to work with them because they're good at actually that type of collaboration. Um, and I don't know, a lot of this is about building trust in the process and I don't know how you teach that to people. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is that I think unless you really understand what is being achieved at any level in the island, um, along what our colleague here from Cape Verde is saying, it's very difficult to know how a partnership intervention is actually going to be helpful or not helpful. Like, what is the gap? Is the, what, where are the gaps? Where are the things where there's a lot of things happening? Those sorts of things. How do you actually understand that? And I think that really does push point to the need to strengthen the monitoring and evaluation of SDGs as well as uh, partnerships at the same time. So maybe that's where the skill set development needs to happen as well. Mm, yes, and of course you mentioned earlier the important thing about bringing the people around the, the, the table or you have something to bring to the issue or affected by the issue, the, sort of, the whole sort of stakeholder mapping approach. Can I just get, go to our floor, Tef? <coughs> yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm hearing private sector, private sector, private sector. I think I'm the only one here from private sector. I never saw private sector on the stand upstairs the other day. And yet I kept hearing it, hearing, hearing it. I think I want to use... Uh, the model of the Rugby World Cup last year because I'm from the Pacific. And that's probably the greatest event for most of us Pacific Islanders, including Australia and New Zealand. And a lot of us smaller countries like Fiji, Tonga and Samoa did very well at the Rugby World Cup. Why? Because we begin at the grass level. We have changed and applied it from the schools into the players like uh, coaches, began to get our coaches upskilled, the refereeing. So these are all the components that help build. And the final 
analysis or test is at the Rugby World Cup. That's the peak. Where are we now? So then we go back again and say, right, this is where we were weak and so on. And I see the same thing and I'm hearing the same thing from the table up front and for others there. I think we know what we require and the solution is, like Nike says, just do it. Just do it. Because in the doing, we're going to find our differences. As our, our sister there from Palau has shared, you know, we're all different sizes, different scopes, different uh, conditions. It's not the same. And therefore, we're not going to have one size fits all. But we, I think we're very much aware, and it's thanks to forums like this and so on, the awareness over the last uh, several dec decades has driven us to realize that whether we come from a very large country like India or for a little one like Palau or Fiji for that matter, the issues are similar. The solutions will probably be similar, but the methodologies and the processes are dependent on the resources available and resources are available. But it's, I think, as somebody put it the other day, oh, there's a lady sitting there who put it. It's hard work, but that's okay. Nothing good comes without hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your intervention. Yeah, there is absolutely a, a philosophy of, with partnering is just get going and bring the people around, have the conversations to then see what emerges. And if you spend all of your time just thinking about things, nothing will ever, will ever happen. Can I yeah, please. Just to add on and the colleague, um, yes. These are all the same things over a decade that we've been hearing. Nothing is new. We must act now. Let's avoid tokenism. Just do it. I, I learned that from this man over here for the past few days. He told me the other day, you're very po uh, political and you're very kind. It's like, okay, fine. Let's do it now. No time better than now. Let's do it. We have to be the champion. We have to walk the talk. For us in the Pacific, I keep hearing walk the talk. But where is it? Let's really do it now. We have different strategies and everything, but if we do it smart and we act that now, let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you so much. But I couldn't quite tell whether you were saying, agreeing, just do it, or whether you're saying, actually, there are many things that get in the way from us just doing it. Agreeing, do it now, but sometimes do it now, we have to be smart because we're in the era of digitalization. So we have different approach. No, no size fit for all. No one, size fit, no one size fit for all. So we have our own different ways, but we have to be smart. And let us always not forget that it's the people. What, what all we are doing is for the people, by the people, and with the people. So do it now together with the people. Thank you. Kate. Um, I was just going to reflect a little bit on this um, with, I think there's a lot of really good examples of partnerships, so trying to lift some of those up would be really helpful to see why are they working. Um, one that I'm thinking of is New Way's new ocean conservation commitment. So we always, when we hear these things like announcements about money, announcements about things, we think about, oh, that's amazing, that must have been easy. But that's like 20 years of work to get to the point where there's a one-minute thing being announced and it came out of a public-private partnership that New Way developed. We don't hear about that in all of the stuff that's talked about, how the government and the NGOs are working together. They've developed a sustainable development plan, we could call it that, for the whole island and they're looking at how they fund it. Driven by New Way, 1,600 people, um, globally relevant. I think that's the sort of thing we really need to lift up the good examples where islands are getting out there and just doing it because like if you looked at them from a capacity perspective you'd say they could never do that like that how are they going to do that everyone's doing 25 jobs admittedly um and they're that's uh, hard for them but we need to kind of give them help them push them up um and not create more other things but try and help some of these things that exist right now and we have a tendency to kind of move on to the new shiny thing all the time and not look at the things that have been around and working and are actually delivering. So I think it's kind of a mixture of both of those. Uh, let's find some of the great examples and share them. And also let's not limit our thinking to thinking that we can't do things 
because we're too small, it's too complicated. I, there's so many examples where SIDS in particular have been able to change that and actually um, do things that many other places in the world actually can't do. Um, we need to lift that up a lot more and drive that forward as um, what we're doing, but not in a Pollyanna-ish way. All right, that's me. Misha. I just realized we've traversed so many different topics now. The thing that I, the things I wanted to say earlier, I'm not even sure, but maybe I'll just cover across a couple of things. Um, I feel like quite conflicted because I, I have this, you know, on one hand, I really like to just do it. And then on the other hand, yeah, so many things get in the way. And um, going back to just this, you know, this, this partnership in terms of us trying to put together a conference, um, we sort of did just do it and then ran into a bunch of obstacles on the way. Um, and in the end, we had to take some risks, you know, do a little bit of ask for, per, ask for forgiveness, um, take some liberties, take some decisions here and there, and, and find a little bit of that, um, that ground. And I think risk is an interesting topic that maybe hasn't been raised here, um, both in terms of how partnerships help to share risk at times, but also the risk that we need to take. Uh, so I'll just put that aside. Um, I quite like this thing of not overthinking it. I think uh, Kate and I think our intervention said this, I should mention Australia didn't do very well because the grassroots uh, of rugby is not there anymore. Uh, I come from Australia. I now live in France, so I have a, a conflict on the rugby. Um, but I, I, I think a little bit of that's right because sometimes we don't learn till we, we get there. We can try and plan, but everything's very complex, it's very messy. So maybe we just need to acknowledge better uh, that it is going to be a messy, uh, complex process. Um, and that we will run into issues, and that we're not trying to have consensus on everything that we do. I think Kate said this, so there are things that we will agree on, but that doesn't mean our entire organizations, et cetera, need to. Um, one of the things just on, on um, building capacity or skills, I, I sort of tend to agree with Kate in the sense of, like, how do you um, build the skill sets of trust and relations, but maybe it comes from practice. But I do think there are certain things around organizational capacities, um, around managing partnerships, uh, if I, if I go into some more formalized partnerships in terms of contracts or MOU or agreement management, things like this, and just in terms of the study that we've been looking at, uh, often we, are, we talk about empowering different um, you know, actors in, in being able to actually uh, work on development, uh, but these actors come at different, different approaches and different levels for different things. So we actually, as, as development partners, also need to think about how do we take a very whole of system thinking to be able to ensure that all actors can participate in the way that they need to. So I think that's uh, an important part. I'm not, I hope those photos are beautiful as well. <laughs> Sorry. I, that's happened to all of us, I know. So whoever is that is that. Um, maybe the last thing that I will say uh, is just this notion of impact, because I think it's come up a lot, and I've been really thinking about this as well. And uh, how do you measure impact on, on partnerships or demonstrate evidence? And maybe I just challenge us to think about what does evidence look like? There are some things that can be quite tangible, you know, where resources and partnerships, for example, or, or money or, or pooling together resources. But I, I wonder how do we actually bring in the evidence that's about uh, ways of working, that's about trust, that's about these things that perhaps a bit more intangible um, in the stories that we share. And, and how do we do that, yet make it robust enough to build an evidence base? Um, and with that, I think, you know, there are evaluations done a lot of corporations, but perhaps uh, Kate mentioned there's a lot of things existing, and I think in, in terms of partnerships, there's a lot of implicit and very localized level partnerships going on that we don't speak of because we're looking for that huge case study story with like 17 partners and all these formalities that we don't maybe recognize some of the, the more implicit things that we do every day and that I think SIDS do really, really well. Let's pause there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And of course, a couple of issues there that uh, we'll we'll talk about. I mean, the first the first one on 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 evidence of partnerships. I think that I think if partnerships are set up properly, then partnerships will have a very sort of clear theory of change about how by working together, how by aligning your resources, the trans, how by bringing together different levers, you are going to affect change. And you can measure along your theory of change. And that's absolutely essential in a partnership. In fact, it's really interesting to hear people always talk about partnerships as if there's something completely different to any other project or program, that somehow we don't seem to put in place the tracking of, of, of evidence. But we need to. 
And as well, of course, as, as being able to measure along a theory of change, there is also the measurement around the partnership itself and how effectively it is operating and, and the, the quality of the health and the, the trust and the relationship, et cetera. And then there's all the other benefits that can come from partnerships too. The increased social capital, the connections that are made, all the, the, the technological transfer, all of these things that can absolutely happen. And we, we can measure all of these things. We just, for some reason, don't. I don't quite know why we, we, we don't. I'm going to come on to... Well, Kate, why don't we? Why are we not measuring these things? Because I think, um, though, I, I just think that people don't have the resources. So, like, in the partnership I'm in, we have, like, three people, and we're implementing, so we don't, I don't necessarily take the time. We've been working on it for years, um, and I think that's a common problem. People are trying to do everything, um, there isn't the capacity in a lot of the things that we're talking about to actually do that. Even in kind of what New Way is doing, that's like four people running a giant, um, quite big thing. So I, th I think it's a lot about that capacity, and I think that there may be ways, like through regional organisations and others, to try and help some of these partnerships strengthen the capacity to measure progress. Um, but a lot of what we hear, I think, makes sense in big countries, but... It's much harder in somewhere like Palau um, with the very limited number of people who are doing everything, not just this partnership, but maybe working in the government, maybe you know, doing community things. How do you actually give them the capacity to do it um, in a realistic way? It's really difficult. I don't really see a lot of great examples um, on the measures side of things, other than in international NGOs and they have a thousand staff. So there's, and money, like the money side of things is a real issue for this. It goes to implementation, not so much measurement. Can I play devil's advocate? If you're not measuring impact, how do you know you're being successful? Yeah, so because our partnership is not focused on implementation, we're a facilitating partnership and mm. it's incredibly difficult to demonstrate that progress. So we have some measures that we track. I don't feel like they're adequate for that purpose, but we also don't have the resources to actually <laughs> do it. Um, at the same time, we have a lot of partners and we're making a lot of progress. So it's kind of, it's a mix, I think, yeah. And I think that what I'm saying is actually very probably true for many other partnerships and initiatives, that the people want to do that, but the realistic thing is that they don't and aren't. Yeah, and of course, many partnerships like the one you're talking about the ultimate impact is far, far down the down the line anyway, so we, you can't be expected to be tracking, tracking that. I'm going to bring up the issue that, that's come up a lot, I think, and this is the issue of actually organisations are not institutionally set up to be able to partner well, and we heard Misha's example of how how the fact that every organisation has its own approach, its own culture, its own way of working, and you bring them together, and suddenly you get this all this friction which makes everything extremely difficult. In the international research and survey that we did, we found something like, we, and we talked about this issue, about institutions being, being organizations being institutionally set up to be fit for partnering, having in place the right strategies and systems and process and, and culture and staff capability, and really importantly, staff time to be able to develop partnerships. And we found that of the 400 or so people who replied, not one single organization was properly, fully set up to, to partner, but 91% of people said they could do better partnerships if your organization was set up to, to partner well. This is, a, this is a serious challenge, particularly this issue about not, people not being given, given, given enough time in their jobs to be able to develop partnerships. And too often it's, it's like an add-on to your, to your job and often, you're not rewarded for it. It's not in your key performance indicators. So my, my question to, to the panel, to the room, is really about how do we, how do we build that? How do, how, how do we get people to understand that you need to invest in organizations to be able to, for them to become able to partner effectively? Do we have an intervention from the, from the room while the panel is thinking? Or, or Misha? 
Can I, maybe I won't answer the question, but can I just throw something out? Because I, 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 I do a lot of work around institutional setups for different, for different things, <laughs> and I think this is a really interesting question, um, and I have lots to say, but I'm not going to say it at this moment. But when, just in, in terms of working with many governments, uh, there's also a whole bunch of capacity frameworks for how do we set up organizations that are also fit to be innovative, that are fit to be citizen-centered, that have integrity, that have trust, now also for partnerships, it's really difficult for organizations and governments to be able to assess themselves against everything. And maybe there's a lot that are harmonized that actually achieve the same things. Um, mm -hmm. But when we think about many of them may not be as well fit for being partnerships, uh, you know, or governments need to also think about what frameworks are they trying to align to, because there are so many out there, uh, it's really difficult to assess yourself against all of them. So I'm just going to throw that out there before, uh, you know, answering the actual question. No, thank you. It's a hugely important point. And of course, some of the, I think, the point about frameworks of innovation and frameworks of partnership, actually, there's definitely overlap there. So I think it's a, a really good point to bring them together. Ola. Ola. Thank you. Thank you, Darian. So uh, I just have a question, I guess, for the panel and maybe for everyone in the room because we have so many sectors sort of represented here. So I, I, I'm just work, uh, asking from the um, perspective of DESA and the UN, I guess, working at the global level. I mean, we're not even sort of operating at the regional level. But we have been supporting this SIDS partnership framework since it was established, and we're trying to, I mean, we're following what the mandate was. So my question is really, in, in your view, to sort of how can these efforts at the global level support partnership building at the national and local level? Is it about capacity development, the skills they're talking about, individual skills, institutional readiness to partner? Is there uh, more opportunities to engage in dialogues between different sectors? Uh, is it about technology, uh, technologies, technology transfer, data uh, access, or is something else needed to build partnership? I mean, uh, is the sort of the, perfect, uh, the perfection the enemy of good partnership in a way? Because we've been talking about, I mean, I know the gentleman saying, uh, just do it. I sort of, uh, I hear that, but I think it could be argued maybe that uh, the organization company behind that slogan might also have had some uh, inherent uh, challenges in their history. So maybe there's also some, something to, uh, to think about that. I mean, is it, so what, what exactly is needed from, from us basically, from the UN at the global level to, um, to, to support partnership building? Is it just to have the right incentives to collaborate and then just partnership will happen? I mean, is that really sufficient? So then, because that would also uh, gear our uh, support for this effort. So it's just a question to, I guess, everyone in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ulla. And we will absolutely come to that question, which is really is asking what, what can the UN do? What can the SIDS partnership framework for action do? moving forward to really support partnering with SIDS level. And just before we come to that, and that's actually will, is indeed the, 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 the final discussion. Juliet, I think you had a, a, a point. So just speaking from an organization that actually has a partnerships uh, team uh, and just sharing uh, how we approach partnerships. So it, it sits with our resource mobilization and partnerships and integration. That's what the unit is called. Um, and so the approach is based on what our members' needs are, and it's really just aligned to what's in our 2050 strategy. Can you just say your organization? SPC, Pacific Community. We have uh, 27 member countries, and um, our team, the way the um, partnership team works is basically to mobilize resources to support our members' uh, sustainable development needs, in a nutshell. Um, I think the point I wanted to make, because we've been talking a lot about how we do partnerships better, in the Pacific there needs to be recognition that we do have informal partnerships. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do settle, we, we use that mechanism to settle conflict, but to also drive initiatives forward where there are barriers. Um, and it's, I don't think it's something that we necessarily talk about, it's um, every Pacific country has their own way of um, navigating that. And it's just a point I wanted to flag because that is something that needs to be considered as part of the broader partnerships discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, no, that's really helpful. In part about having the structures in place internally, you have your partnerships unit, but yeah, partnerships as a way of addressing, addressing conflict and is, is hugely important. Thank you. So let's, let's move to this, this question is, what can, what can the UN do at the global level to support partnering within SIDS? And you know, Ulla mentioned a few things from building capacity of, of individuals to supporting the institutions to become fit for partnering to supporting the development of, of platforms in country, that the type of dialogue platforms that lead to partnership, possibly around issues on, on policy. I don't know the degree to which the policies are, are holding back collaboration and, and partnership. What would be most helpful to get these partnerships going? And this is for the panel, for the room, so. Please. Um, there's something that I think is my perspective we should take in consideration. First of all, uh, as I mentioned before, it's for what you are for, what you are, we are working for. Um, as I know, I think all of us, at least all the seeds or all the countries, at least for developing countries, we have national strategic plan. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of us who have all NDCs, we have one app, so that means we have strategy. I think all this partnership, all these ways to implement is to see how we can implement those documents. As I mentioned, in Cape Verde we did like this, but of course for the other countries, they should do on the same way. It's, it cannot be a government document, it's a national document, or at least it's a perspective for the vision for the country. Since we have this, let me say we have some guidance. So we have some guidelines to, to guide us to go to implement, to implement the, the, the strategies, to implement the, 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 the reforms and so on. So that means we have this. Since we have this, we can see the way is two things. First, we need a resource to do that. We need capacity to do that. And uh, there's a thing that I like that Amisha said is to who we should work with. So, uh, of course, if I want to implement some measures related to the climate change, I have to bring someone who has capacity to do something related to the climate change. If I don't have this capacity, as I mentioned before, we need to bring someone that has this capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the question that we have to take in consideration to see how we can implement things, because um, partnership it's not because just we want to do. I like this vision to see just do it, but just do it on the right way. Do it smart, as we heard. Yes, yes. do it with smart way. So this is the question that we have to, 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 to think uh, about. So uh, when we have this, let me say we can first, we can have more uh, uh, um, availability for partnership. Even you can engage more all stakeholders to do the partnership and also you can bring all together to do this partnership. So I think it is the vision that you have to, to think, because as I mentioned before, let me just repeat it, we are not reinvent the well. It's already done. We just need to do it. We just need to take the best way to do that, but of course in a smart way. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Please, at the end, Willie. Today, um, during my Talk, I refer to a document, the policy that we had. Um, so in our case in the Solomon Islands, the policy quietly stipulates where the coordination and the partnership should be. Um, it gives the roles that East Lion Ministries and even the Central Ministries should do. So uh, when you come to the country, a, a diplomatic level, you negotiate with the foreign affairs. After you negotiate with the foreign affairs, then you come down to the mm -hmm development cooperation, just where you will partner together and they will bring you who do you want to see. So, but in most occasions, because there are other players, like you have the office of the prime minister, they will also be engaging and um, even the foreign affairs, sometimes people see them and then they continue on going. Um, so I'm bringing up this because if you want to establish a, 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 a certain place where partnership should be centered. I think 
you should look at centralizing it at one, uh, at, at one um, ministry or maybe one organization. Because um, from experience, uh, different uh, organizations will come in and meet different uh, line ministries. But at the end of the day, you will see that they will come back to us because mm. we have the expertise and we have the courage to do things uh, to, to report and then negotiate. Often we see these units in the office of the Prime Minister or in the Cabinet Office because it's cross-ministerial. Um, that's what we see in, in, in certain other countries. But thank you. We've only got a few minutes left, so we're going to go, we're going to go quite quick fire. Um, Kate, I mean, you've already talked about the, the fact that there are good examples out there and perhaps there is some more learning that can be done, can be brought to the table about the good, good partnerships. Or what else, do you, what else do you see? All the panel, what do you see? What are the things that will make a difference? Yeah, I think bringing some of those examples up, um, there's like the government ones, and also looking at um, places where changes in um, government leadership haven't tanked partnerships. I think that would be a good thing. Like, where, where are some of those examples where partnerships continue um, through following uh, government um, groups? I think um, tools are really important, um, but thinking about the capacity, um, capacity question in a way that's relevant to the SID space, because I think... Um, it's really how do you facilitate those tools? How do the region organisations help? There's lots of other players um, in this space, I think, in the SID space. And then um, finding a way to incentivise registering the partnerships, because I think that people don't, um, because there's not an incentive. I remember this has been a problem for like 20 years, uh, not just in this process. And then also, um, yeah, really some... Um, case studies of this I think would be really super useful and then some training of people um, on how to actually implement partnerships that they've already come up with and may already be doing how do we strengthen some of those things so that's what I would focus on it's the people side of things thank you so much Lainey When Ola raised the question, and I tried to go back in the three years of the work that I had uh, directly with the UN, so, um, not just for UN, but for development uh, partners, I think there should be an improved uh, coordination and collaboration between development partners. Because sometimes UN agencies come to the national level, they're working, they're not coordinating, they're working in silos, so different uh, agencies, UN agencies can be doing uh, duplicating efforts. So that's one, improving uh, coordination and collaboration efforts. And of course, we're talking about capacity building, resourcing, uh, training and such, but we have to work together in a smart way, thinking creatively, innovate, being innovative is coming from the region with the uh, limited resources. And of course, we need someone who will champion, walk the talk, and make those things happen now. No time better than now. Thank you so much. Yes, the time is now. Misha. Well, I think the answer to your question is everything. You need to do everything. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I think this is, this is the hard part. It is really different. There's lots of things that can be done, um, but there is everything from that capacity building. I think the tools are really important. Um, each country is in a really different space, and this also is about what type of partnership. Um, you know, some of those demand certain types of capacities or certain types of supports or certain types of incentives. Others may not. Um, some countries have very good digital uh, infrastructure and, and uh, connection infrastructure. Others don't. So, again, I think it's, it's quite difficult to have just a, a one-size or a blanket kind of approach. Um, but I do like this, this thing of how do we sort of distill a little bit more of, of the case studies and the learnings. Um, and I was thinking about that in like, uh, you know, some of the more informal partnerships, uh, just thinking about how things get done formally. 
Um, but also how some of this is disseminated. I know at the OECD, and I think UN can be a bit of a culprit of this too, is we, 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 we disseminate very long reports, you know, like hundreds of pages, and the, the nuggets of gold are sort of deep in there, but no one has time to look at this. So like, how do we have dialogues that um, can help move uh, decisions or move approaches? Um, how do we have not just networks for talking, but how do we help that talking turn a bit into action? And how do we distill some of the learnings? How do we distill some of uh, the supports in a way that's um, a little bit more practical and tangible? And, and maybe that's just something for me at the OECD, actually, more so than anyone else. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, you all very much indeed. I think those words that needs to be practical and tangible, I think, is, is hugely important as we as we move forward. We've heard all all sorts of, of thoughts and suggestions. I think the point about things being context specific is is absolutely right, both the SIDS context, but of course every island has absolutely its own specific specific context. We've heard a lot about sort of case studies and building capabilities in, in, in people, so things like training, things like uh, creating various tools, etc. Certainly we've heard about improvement and coherence among development partners. This is something we hear a lot about, is that, there are, that actually there's just too many, too many partners wanting their own specific thing, and actually the, the Paris and then the Busan Agreement do talk about exactly this, about much better cooperation amongst development partners to be much more, much more cohesive. Looks like there's also some thoughts around, yes, some, some research and really understanding the, the case studies, including the much more sort of the informal partnerships, which might be delivering, but is, are not written up anywhere. And then it sounds like there's issues around <coughs> measurement of, if not, not direct impact, but just measurement of the success of these partnerships to be able to demonstrate the success of those. And I suspect if you can start to do that, then you can also be making the case for, for governments, for other organizations to, to invest the time of their staff in developing these, these partnerships. Because that's the one thing that has come through very clearly is these partnerships take a long time to develop. And I think we need to, we need to speed that up and we can speed that up partly through these types of capacity development and, and various different trainings to build up people's ability to develop these partnerships so much faster. So with that, I'd like us to put our hands together to thank very much indeed our <laughs> panel, to thank you, the audience in the room and the audience sitting at home or in your offices. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Darren, for such a productive discussion, and I feel that we all learned a lot from today. Now, that brings uh, us to almost the end of our time together, but we do have some final thoughts from two speakers. So let me now introduce Miss Andy Fong Toy, head of the sub-regional office for the Pacific for UNSCAP. Miss Fong Toy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, a moderator. Uh, I'm actually not going to share any thoughts. I think <laughs> I would not do justice uh, to the thoughts that have come out from this room in the summary, but um, Ola will we'll talk and, and pull it together in terms of the next steps. What I did want to do was to thank everybody uh, for not just today, but the week. Uh, you know, today we've heard so much about the capacity uh, constraints we have. Uh, in SEDS and particularly uh, Pacific SEDS. So I do very much appreciate your commitment to spend the whole week here. Uh, you know, for, I think for a lot of us, you are juggling so many different tasks. So it, it's a really big ask to ask people from the Pacific to come anywhere, let alone somewhere as far as Bangkok and for the week. And I know some of you are staying on for uh, Monday, Tuesday. So you've probably been away from your desk by the time you counted for a week and a half. And so really, I would just like to acknowledge that and, and express our appreciation. And I do hope that you have actually had benefit, you know, from this week and a half, because as I said, it's a huge commitment and, and it would be pointless if you've come all this way and you haven't really had value. So I, I do hope that not only the, the Monday and today's partnership, uh, but also the week that you've had uh, in our headquarters here with the APFSD. Um, I'd like to thank our partner, Dessa, 
uh, not only for the substantive work you've done, but also the financial support. So, you know, thank you. And I saw the, you know, about the Odessa Pacific Trust Fund. Uh, so we really are very appreciative uh, of that support because if it wasn't for Odessa, you wouldn't have been able to come uh, for this week. Uh, and saying that, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the OECD for next week's uh, event, uh, Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I give my apologies that I will be leaving tomorrow and I won't be here for Monday and Tuesday. And, and I do hope that you also find that uh, equally uh, valuable. And I'd just like to reconfirm uh, UNSCAP support uh, as we continue this journey uh, for the SIDS uh, for conference. Um, and that we really, together with our partners, you know, DESA, OECD, for example, and, and uh, you know, with development partners, that we do hope that we can maximise uh, the outcomes for you uh, at SIDS 4. And so I hope you, those of you who are staying back, you do enjoy the study to tomorrow, you have a good break, that you do have a, a relaxing weekend, and those of us uh, who are travelling back, safe travels. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Ms. Fong Toy, for taking your time to be with us today, and we are very glad to get your perspective. And last but not least, I would like uh, to invite Ola to share his final thoughts with us. Thank you so much, Ms. B, and I'll, I'll sit here if you don't mind. Uh, so, uh, ladies, gentlemen, uh, colleagues, as we draw close to this uh, SIDS Partnership Symposium, I also want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you for your active participation and your insightful contributions over these two days. Your dedication to uh, SEEDS and partnership um, has, uh, is truly inspiring. So thank you so much for that. Uh, throughout this symposium, we have dwelled into several critical areas that, areas that are pivotal for the sustainable development of SEEDS, including partnership for science, technology, innovation, digitalization, partnership for improving access to climate finance, and the crucial role of higher education in driving sustainable development in SIDS. And lastly, we also have uh, explored how the SIDS partnership framework uh, that was established to support partnerships uh, for the Samoa pathway can be improved, improved in the next decade of action for SIDS. So from, from these uh, fruitful discussions and exchange of ideas, uh, several key themes and recommendations have emerged. And uh, this was prepared before today's session, so it's definitely not going to cover everything, but just a couple of broad points. There's a pressing need to enhance the awareness and the utilization of the SIDS partnership framework, ensuring it's effective in supporting SIDS uh, in building partnerships. We need to build on the past experiences, uh, whether they are good or less good, and fostering more regional and national collaborations, and incentive active involvement from all sectors and stakeholders in building meaningful collaboration, collaborations that yield positive impact in SIDS. Clarity, accountability, and long-term focus are essential for the success of partnerships, along with simplification of various uh, processes that are involved in this and increased visibility to encourage, encourage engagement. Resource allocation, training, tools, capacity building, these are all crucial for sustaining partnership initiatives and driving meaningful progress. So looking ahead, it's uh, quite imperative that we translate these insights into action. Uh, therefore, I am announcing, announcing the following next steps. So one is that we'll uh, compile a comprehensive report Summary, summarizing these key findings and recommendations on how the SIDS partnership framework can effectively be strengthened. This uh, report and recommendations will be presented to the, to the steering committee on SIDS partnerships for their further consideration. And we hope that these recommendations that come from these, uh, these days will serve to inspire the discourse on partnerships in preparation for the SIDS4 conference and its outcome. And two, we will conduct an assessment of the requirements needed to scale up partnership on these select priority areas that we have discussed. This would include mapping of the key actors involved, the partnerships, initiatives, as well as identifying the required resources needed to scale up this collaboration. So in closing, uh, everyone, let me reiterate our, uh, our appreciation at DESA for your commitment to advancing partnerships for prosperity, 
and well-being of small island developing states. Uh, together, I am quite confident that we can chart a course towards a more sustainable, resilient, and prosperous future for all. And finally, I would like to, uh, of course, thank the co-organizers, UNSCAP and UNOSD, for their gracious support in making this event possible. Thank you so much for your attention. Many thanks again, Ola. So that brings us to the end of the event today. And um, many thanks, big thank you once again to all our speakers today for answering, um, answering all the questions. And thank you to you, our audience, both in person and online. If you're watching on Zoom, there will be an exit survey that pop up when you leave the meeting. Please do fill in and share your thoughts with us. We appreciate your feedback and that will help us plan for the future events for you. The UN DESA will continue its global policy dialogue series in the coming month, including more sessions related to the upcoming fourth international conference on small island developing states. And now some links to share with you. We will pop these into the Zoom chat and YouTube description as well. Please go to un.org slash DESA to find out about the policy dialogues and go to sdgs.un.org uh, forward slash sits forward slash Bangkok, uh, sorry, forward slash BKK for all the details and follow up to this symposium. And finally, to un.org slash small islands to learn more about the conference um, this coming May. Thank you once again for tuning in. And thanks to our colleagues at UNDESA and UNSCAP. And have a wonderful rest of your day and night wherever you are um, from me and the team here in Bangkok. Thank you.